Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Hello and welcome to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and Family Talk is the broadcast division of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. The JDFI is completely listener-supported. To learn more, go to drjamesdobson.org. And happy belated Independence Day. Yesterday, of course, was July 4th, and I hope that you were able to spend it celebrating and relaxing with friends and family. The United States of America is a unique nation, to say the least. Its founding was undeniably providential. And as a country, we have aided and liberated many oppressed peoples over the past 244 years. We have a great storied history. And every year, we set aside one day to remember our country's fight for independence. Throughout the years, our country has received some harsh criticism, both from within and without our borders. Dr. Dobson is always quick to testify that America is not perfect and never has been. But he also holds to the ideal that the United States is a great nation. And I definitely agree with that sentiment. Our guest on today's Family Talk broadcast is author and speaker Dr. William Bennett. Dr. Bennett served as Secretary of Education under President Ronald Reagan, and then from 1989 to 1990, he held the post of Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy under President George H.W. Bush. Since 2004, Dr. Bennett has been hosting conservative talk radio shows and podcasts. He's the author of several books, including The Book of Virtues, Tried by Fire, and Our Sacred Honor. Today, Dr. Dobson and Dr. Bennett will talk about a few of America's heroes, including George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and others who helped shape the early history of our nation. Let's listen now to this important conversation concerning Dr. Bennett's book entitled America, The Last Best Hope. I don't ever remember starting an interview with an author by saying, what's the significance of that title? But in this case... I want you to express it. <laughs> it's Lincoln's words, of course, uh, as so many of our words about our country are Lincoln's or Washington's. He said in a, a speech, a talk, and a message he sent to Congress, he said, we shall nobly save or meanly lose this last best hope of earth. The words are beautiful, as they often are with Lincoln. What perhaps is more interesting is when he said it. He said we were the last best hope of earth after the Battle of Antietam. Mm-hmm. sometimes called the Battle of Sharpsburg, yes. uh, the, the bloodiest day in American history still. Um, 21,000 casualties, 22,000 casualties at that battle in Maryland, not far from where I live. I drive out there sometimes on an early mm-hmm. morning and look at the, the battle scene. Um, it was touch and go. It wasn't clear whether this nation would survive. It wasn't clear whether the Union would prevail. Lincoln was assailed on many, many sides, I've sent a number of messages to the White House along with the book about reading Mm -hmm. about Lincoln during his Mm -hmm. time. His cabinet was not with him. The man who was running the war for him, General McClellan, people thought, you know, he might try to take control of the government and military. In fact, if the North had lost that battle, Lincoln would have probably uh, been thrown out of office. They were very close to Washington. And there was that chance. There was the chance at Gettysburg. You're you're exactly right. And... uh, I mean, it was touch and go. It was not at all clear that we would survive. But Lincoln said at the time, we are the last best hope of earth. And it struck me in writing this book at this time that it's right to say it again. Uh, If you are sitting in some God-forsaken place in the world, if you have no hope, if there is a military coming over the hill with a flag, what flag do you want it to be? Despite what our critics say, People all over the world want it to be the United States, the flag of the United States. I, means, I came to Washington. Means deliverance. I came to Washington to hear you speak when you were Secretary of Education, and uh, you used a phrase then that uh, you've referenced in this book again. You call it the Gates test. The Gates test. Yeah. You remember that day yes, that I do. you spoke for us? Explain yes. what the Gates test. I is. refer to it in the book. You're absolutely right. I, when I was Secretary of Education. Uh, I taught in 120 schools around the country, and a young woman in San Diego said, you obviously love the country. She said, I'm not so sure about it, but why do you think it's such a great place? I said, well, it would take, you know, I'll give you a reading list, but I said, I'll give you a short answer. I said, every country has its gates, 
I said, and when a country raises its gates, you want to find out about the country, you look to see which way people run. Do they run in or do they run out? I said, when we raise our gates, people run in. When we don't raise our gates, people run in, which is why we're talking yeah. about this immigration issue. Other nations raise their gates and people run out. I said, that's a very good test of what a country is. And from the beginning, people have fled to this country, have looked to this country. Hmm. Yeah, given that uh, historical fact and the way it is today, isn't it amazing that there's such a sizable number of people in the media and in the liberal community that despise this country and its freedoms it's, and are doing everything they can to undermine it? It's never been this bad in terms of the media. I wouldn't say that presidents haven't had it this hard. They have. Lincoln was one. But in terms of the media, it has never been like this. Um, David McCullough says that, that if Washington or Lincoln had had to face the press and the press reports that you have now, these things wouldn't have been won. If Washington, if the reports of the battles, mm -hmm. Washington lost more battles than any general in modern history. Luckily, he won some big ones and he, he, he pulled some very good surprises off. But that if it had been reported, the discouragement would have been so great. Well, you uh, you made reference a minute ago to uh, the fact that this great experiment in liberty that uh, Lincoln spoke about is is not a foregone conclusion. Absolutely. We could lose it. We could lose it. And it's probably in as much danger right now as it has ever been, including the uh, Revolutionary War. I think it's a very serious time. Um, and the question I have is whether we have the cultural resolve, the moral resolve. No doubt about our soldiers. No doubt about our military. Their ability to get the job done and the kind of people we have. But um, whether we have it culturally, whether we will call things by their right name, whether we will endure. Um, the founders, and I talk about this in the book, hoped that we could survive for 100, 150 years. Th that was their hope. Yes. Because places of this size, democracies, republics, just don't have a history of surviving very long. So we've, you know, we've set a record. But the question is, Jim, as you say, whether whether we will endure. I, I do think, I don't want to just hit the, you know, the thing again, the cliche about, you know, those who don't study history are condemned to repeat it. But one, of the, parts, one of the parts of the book that people have picked up on is our war with the Barbary pirates in 1800. This That's was our, Muslims. It was our first war with Muslims. You know what they were doing? They were kidnapping people, mm -hmm. holding them for ransom. And at the time this was going on, there were about a million and a half Christians being held as slaves by Muslims, Muslim warlords. And they were taking our ships and then making us pay ransom. And Jefferson, and I'm kind of on and off Jefferson, you know, yes, no. I got to tell you, on this one, he said, we're not going to take this. We're not going to let these people get away with this. And John Adams, he said, I'm not sure you can fight these people. Why? He said, I think if you fight these people, you will be fighting them forever. This is 1800. 1800. Well, 200 years later, the fight's still Because of the religious fanaticism yeah. that values death. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm not implying that um, all Muslims are violent. Uh, I'm sure of what I've been told that the vast majority are peace-loving people who would do us no harm. But a small percentage of a big number is still a very big number. And uh, there are, I'm told, uh, 1.2 billion Muslims on the face of the earth. And if 10% of them believe the Koran instructs them to kill infidels, which would include us, um, that is 120 million people who would give their lives to destroy us. Uh, but let's assume that figure is grossly overstated. If only 4% are fighting the jihad or the holy war, that still means 48 million people want to kill us. You know, that's a threat of enormous uh, proportions uh, when you start talking about nuclear bombs and uh, other weapons of mass destruction. You're exactly right. That's 48 million. We saw what 19 could do on 9-11. On 
Bernard Lewis, who is the great scholar of uh, Islam, retired professor at Princeton. I was with him not long ago. I asked him the exact question. I said, of the 1.2 billion, he said 10 to 15 percent. That gets it up to 200 million. I mean, it's a it's a whatever, whether it's 50 or 200. Well, that explains why you say our national life. That's right. That and then we threatened. and then we look at the, the numbers out of Great Britain where they did those polls after the July 7th um, uh, killings in uh, in London. And uh, 13% of Muslims in London said they supported the suicide bombers. 13% of 2.2 million. That's a significant number of people. Now, you know what? I hadn't planned for us to talk about all this on this program because uh, your book is uh, not just on... You know the threat to this nation. Yeah. It's the great heritage of this story. nation the and the stories. And we've got a whole lot more to right. talk about right. here. You're listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk in an interview featuring Dr. Dobson and author and speaker Dr. William Bennett. They've been discussing America's rich heritage and storied legacy. Since its founding, the United States have been a symbol against oppression and a bastion of hope for the oppressed. But our nation is not without its flaws. Let's join Dr. Dobson and his friend Bill Bennett once again as they tackle a few of the darker parts of our nation's history. Of course we're imperfect. We have some very embarrassing components to our history. Slavery. And some of what uh, we did to Native Americans, that was evil. That was wrong. Right. But there's also an awful lot that's good here. It's less than perfect, but find me a better one. That's right. And and the amazing thing about America is, and I tell the story. I mean, I tell the stories of the of the of the wicked things, the atrocities, uh, and uh, in an unblinking way. But the amazing thing about this country is the capacity to recognize a problem and to deal with it. Sometimes it takes us too long, as it did with slavery and emancipation, but we get there. But this capacity to set it right, self-renewal. One of the figures in the book, a giant figure for me. Frederick. I, uh, Frederick. Douglass, you know I, was gonna I do that. knew you were going to say that. He just is just larger than life. And uh, I love his quotes. You know, he meets Lincoln and someone says, you met the president. You know, this black man goes in and meets the president. He says, yes. He says, what did you think of the president? He said, well, he's intelligent, but he's got some growing to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, you know he, this guy was, <laughs> yeah. I guess if you are a slave and you gain your freedom one day, by, you know, when you're the, the man they had on the plantation there in Eastern Maryland who was there as the slave breaker. This is the guy who's to break the will of a slave, anybody who shows any gumption. Yes. And when Douglas turns on him and pins him, he realizes, with the help of a couple other people too, he realizes then that uh, there's only one way he can go, and that's all out, you know, and strong. Mm -hmm. And so then he goes, he goes to Boston, he goes north. But he remains a very strong supporter of Lincoln. A very strong Republican. I'm, this uh -huh. is just historical fact. I'm not advocating. But <laughs> this is not a political I, no, editorial. I right? Not a political editorial. And again, his his way of presenting things, and his impatience for justice, and his talk with uh, a number of his of the of his friends were very active uh, to get to vote for women. And he said, fine, important, but us first. They're not lynching you. They're lynching us. We're first. You're mm -hmm. second. Uh -huh. They wanted him to put things on equal plane. Didn't he, he say said something about the, the Constitution had not one word in it that authorized slavery. That's exactly but right. But it had the foundations exactly. within it that ended slavery. Exactly right. He said that. And in saying that, he, he said something which was then later picked up on by Martin Luther King who goes back, as Douglas did and as Lincoln did, to the founding documents, to the Constitution. But even more, and of course, you know, this is a big debate among the scholars, which is the document, the Constitution, the Declaration. I'm a Declaration man mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and yes. endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And Douglas goes back and says, that's the foundation. Uh, that's the foundation of our freedom. But he is a fabulous, uh, fabulous character. And uh, anyway, all these, all these wonderful <laughs> stories. We are jumping around chronologically right. here, uh, sure. Bill, just because that's the way the conversation has unfolded. But uh, you um, 
uh, spent a lot of time talking about George Washington here. Right. He was not just the father of our country and the first president, but the character of that man comes through. Yeah. Uh, explain why. My favorite story, it's a commonplace, but I love the story. It's about character. At the end of the war, a lot of the soldiers wanted to march on Philadelphia to get their money. And Washington was trying to discourage them. Not a good way to start the government, which is to hold the Congress at bay at that point. I understand the temptation. <laughs> I've been there a couple of times, but it's not a good idea. So he's trying to persuade them. And he was, another one of his things is, uh, you know, he was not a great public speaker. But he remembered something that someone had given him, a slip of paper. So he pulled it out of one pocket. The other pocket, he pulled his glasses out. And his men had never seen him with his spectacles. And he noticed that. He heard the crowd go silent. And he said, I see that you um, noticed that I wear glasses. He said, well, it was to be. I have not only grown old and gray, I have become almost blind in the service of my country. Hmm. That simple, yeah. unrehearsed, spontaneous statement, and everyone started to cry. They were reminded of who this man was and what he had done for the country. Uh -huh. The respect for him, this one of the ironies I talk about, was so great that several of the founders pointed out that we almost blew it, we almost went back to monarchy because the regard for him was so great. The first proposal for his title, you know, they had to, we had to rename things. We had to rename who our commander in chief would be. The first title, John Adams came up with it, was His Glorious Highness, the President of the United <laughs> States and Glorious Protector of the Liberties, of our liberties. And William McClay from Pennsylvania said, What's with Adams? Doesn't he understand what we fought this thing for? It's to get rid of all that stuff. Well, but you know, such was the regard for Washington. The reason that I consider him to be such a hero is right along this point that uh, almost no one in human experience gives up power That's willingly. Right. That's right. It is intoxicating. And once you have it, you don't want to let it go. And he could have been king. Right. But he served two terms as president and would not accept even a third exactly term. Right. And, uh, and you talk about greatness. That really speaks to me. The world was watching. And, and George, King George said, uh, it was this moment, wh whether he would give up his power, said um, if he gives up his power, as he said he will, he will be the greatest man in the world. And he did it. Did he say that? And he did it without a moment's hesitation. Hmm. Another of your heroes in this book. This is just one story right after another yeah. that give you a sense of pride yeah. and dignity. Not uh, arrogant pride, but thankfulness yeah. and gratefulness for uh, the leaders that, uh, that the Lord gave us. And especially when we consider... Uh, what was going on in the rest of the world right. at that time? I mean, the French Revolution r resulted in all this the killing in the streets. And, and then, of course, the British had had their civil war. And, right. and here, right in the middle of that, is this ultimate statement of a representative form of government, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That makes me want to cheer. You bet. And it, it makes should. me want to defend this country, and it makes me angry when I hear the media assaulting what we have stood for. I know. Well, let's press on. Uh, uh, Bill, let's turn our attention now to our 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt, who really had just about everything going for him when he was younger. Yes, had the, uh, had the silver spoon, had, had all that Harvard, but didn't let it hold him back. Uh, a guy just full of energy and drive for, uh, for his country, full of patriotism. When he was police commissioner in New York, he walked the beat at night. You know, He walked hmm. in the middle of the night to find out if everybody was doing their job. Um, he was a, an extraordinary human being who had a deep and, and just pervasive sense of right and wrong. When he went west out into the Dakotas where he developed his great love of, of America, he, uh, you know, the, these, these two guys had stolen something from him. He went out, he captured them, brought them back, both of them back. Well, so his they kept style referring. was to speak softly and carry a big stick. It sure was. It sure Still kind of makes sense, doesn't yes, it? Yes. Uh, we have an American, uh, Perticaris, who was kidnapped uh, by Rasuli, who's this uh, chieftain in uh, Barbary chieftain. And uh, he says uh, some question about whether he was an American citizen. Roosevelt assumed he was an American citizen. And uh, this uh, this chieftain uh, uh, over there in Morocco takes kidnaps him and... Uh, 
you know, Roosevelt gets a wire back, and he sends a wire back immediately. He said, uh, Perticaris alive or Rosuli dead? No, don't mess with the American citizen. I want my citizen back or you're dead. I will send the U.S. military with all its might. When I come back to what I was saying, how impressive uh, our entrance into Afghanistan was and the beginnings of Iraq and where American military power is used when it's when it's presented, it needs to be unambiguously powerful. It should not be sparing. It shouldn't if be you're going to go in there, get it over with and get out. And I think our willingness to exercise military power in, in a way that is unambiguous is in some ways a measure of our internal confidence. Now, if, if I'm sounding bloodthirsty to the audience, I just want to point out and remind people the last seven times that the United States military has been deployed, it has been deployed to save Muslims. Mm. To save Muslims, go just go through it. Iraq, uh, Kosovo, uh, Kosovo, S- S- Afghanistan, Somalia. Somalia. Exactly right. I mean, just you, you just keep going, and and we have done this and done it, and have liberated in the last seven deployments fifty million or more Muslims. Hmm. I am proud of the work that you've done uh, with this book, Bill. I do hope that our listeners and especially their older kids will read this book. Well, it's not a heavy tome. I, it's the great story of America. I mean, and the story is full of romance and drama and comedy and humor and characters like you wouldn't believe. This is a place not only where people have dreams, but the dreams actually come true. They really do come true. You have called it, in fact, the second greatest story ever told. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> After the, that's the right. great story of uh, Christ coming. That's, that's correct. This is the greatest political story. It, it is the greatest story. And uh, people come here in hope. Um, and, uh, and, you know, one of the reasons I wrote this book was to correct the revisionist stuff. I told you the last time I was here, there was a history book. They've now changed it that uh, defined the Puritans as people uh, of the 17th century who took long trips. People from oh, England boy. who took long because they didn't want to get into the religion thing, yeah. you know, because yeah. that's not appropriate to talk about in schools. Don't you understand? Baloney. <laughs> the title of the book is America, the Last Best Hope, Volume One, from the Age of Discovery to a World at War uh, by Dr. William J. Bennett. Um, uh, have the best days gone forever? I don't think so. Nation? I think our greatest days are still ahead of us because the influence now on the world that we have had. I mean, the founders hoped we'd last 150 years. We've beat, we beaten that record by, by a bunch, and now we move on. But this is the challenge. The challenge that is before us is as great as anything we've ever faced. Well, that was an inspiring reminder of our rich heritage in the United States and the challenges that lie before us if we want to keep our nation great. In Ronald Reagan's farewell address to the American nation, our 40th president stated, quote, if we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. During today's broadcast, Dr. Bill Bennett and Dr. James Dobson emphasized the importance of remembering our collective national history, both the good as well as the not so good. Now, to learn more about Dr. William Bennett, his podcast called The Bill Bennett Show, and his many books, including America, The Last Best Hope, visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. That's drjamesdobson.org. Remember, you can always give us a call as well at 877-732-6825. We're here all day, every day, to answer any of your questions about the broadcast or the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. And while you're on the phone with us, you can also request a CD copy of today's broadcast to keep or to share. Again, that number is 877-732-6825. If you'd like, you can send a request to us through the mail at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, P.O. Box 39000, Colorado Springs, Colorado, the zip code 80949. Again, that address is the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, P.O. Box 39000, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80949. Thanks again for listening to Family Talk, and be sure to join us again tomorrow for another patriotic broadcast in honor of this past Independence Day weekend. From all of us at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, have a blessed day. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.
Hey everyone, did you know that radio is more popular now than ever? A new feature here at Family Talk we're excited to announce. It's called the Station Finder feature. This is Dr. Tim Clinton for Family Talk. I want to tell you how you can listen to our daily broadcast on a station near you. Go to the broadcast menu at drjamesdobson.org, then click on the Family Talk radio stations button. Once you're there, you're going to see an interactive map of radio affiliates, which, by the way, is growing every day. Simply click on your home state, and then you'll see where our broadcast is airing in your town. Stop randomly spinning around the dial, hoping to find Dr. Dobson and Family Talk. Go to drjamesdobson.org and take advantage of this brand new Station Finder feature.